It is now time for me to introduce our fantastic keynote. Someone who holds the record for this conference in having been a presenter three times. When Sam Caldione opened Dog Dogfish Head in 1995, it was the smallest commercial brewery in America, making 10 gallons of beer at a time. And today, Dogfish Head is among the fastest growing breweries in the country. Under his leadership, it has grown into a 200-person company with a restaurant, a brewery, and a distillery in Rehoboth Beach, a beer-themed hotel on the canal in Lewis, and a production brewery in Milton, Delaware, selling beer in 31 states. When we began planning for this conference and chose the theme of innovation, we immediately thought of Sam. Guided by his motto of off-centered ales for off-centered people, he has created a culture of innovation at his company that is truly unique and it's revered across the country. In addition to his many awards, Fast Company Magazine named Sam one of the 100 most creative people in business in 2011. Please welcome our very own celebrity, Sam Caldione. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Here. All right. You're up. I want to work. I don't know how to work this thing, so we're going to learn that together. Let me just check it once. Uh, okay, I think I do. I can learn this as I go. Um, so, so many uh, familiar faces out in this uh, crowd. Uh, so many inspiring entrepreneurs, business people, and community leaders, community builders out here. So thank you guys for what you do uh, every day on behalf of me and my, I think we're about 230 coworkers now who almost all of us, aside from about 20 of our regional salespeople, almost all of us live and work uh, in coastal Delaware. So thank you for making our uh, community so, so vibrant uh, and exciting. So with the theme being uh, in innovation, I'm going to uh, kind of, uh, in the spirit of innovation, wing this uh, a little bit uh, and just take you through uh, some slides back and forth from some of the original inspiring quotes that I wove into my business plan, which I started writing when I was living in New York City in about 93. I was uh, starting to finish it when I moved to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where Mariah was, my wife Mariah, born Bred Milford, was finishing up at Brown, and I moved there with her while she was finishing. And then I actually completed the my plan on this uh, very campus. Uh, Bill Poff offered a class in 1994 about finishing a, a business plan, so I thought it'd be uh, appropriate uh, for me to share some of the, the, the inspiring quotes that, that uh, I, I put into that plan 22-ish uh, years ago about, about the age of this conference itself, which is pretty cool. Um, so I was an English major. I went to Muhlenberg College about two and a half hours up the road from here, or maybe a little more than that in Allentown. Um, and now when I go around the country and do a beer events uh, or, or overseas, people are always stunned to hear that, you know, the scale of our brewery was able to grow to this. Uh, there's Bill. Hi, Bill. Uh, the, the, the scale of the brewery was, was uh, we could get to the scale in, in a relatively rural coastal area. It's not a mecca of brewing like Munich or Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, and they're even more surprised that we've been able to grow this company with, with uh, you know, me as an English major uh, at a, at, in a, such a uh, nuts and bolts business and production uh, world. Um, but I always say there's no better training to be a, a, a business person than an English major because there's no greater example of creative writing than a business plan. Uh, fictional writing, <laughs> where you write a document a fictional document, you hand it to a banker and say, I want you to help me make this fairy tale come true. Uh, and so many of those beautiful business plans uh, don't make it out of that, uh, that sort of fictional uh, 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 phase. And it's really through the industry and innovation of 
passionate people, uh, both owners and employees, co-workers at company that have the vision to take a work of fiction and turn it into a work of non-fiction as I've been lucky to do alongside my co-workers uh, over the last uh, 20 years. So on the, on the first page of, page of our my business plan was this quote from Emerson, who so would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. For nothing at last is sacred but the integrity of your own mind. And that, to me, is a rallying cry for any entrepreneur and speaks to this concept of innovation, which is there's already something out there defined as, as the right thing or the good thing in whatever industry your, your product or your, surface, you know, your service is going to exist in. And so many people take it for granted that the biggest thing, the status quo, is not worth challenging. But if you can find an innovative way to go on your own path and your own exploration of goodness, and if you do, do a great job of defining it and differentiating it and bringing quality to it, uh, then there'll be a, a group of people that find value in where you're going uh, and will follow you on that journey. That, of course, couldn't fit on a, on a six-pack, so we shortened it to off-centered ales for off-centered people. Uh, <laughs> But it really does mean uh, the same thing. And from the first day we opened Dogfish as a food and beer company in, Re in Rehoboth, uh, Delaware, our goal to, to innovate and, and differentiate ourselves from the status quo of the beer world was all about trying to establish the first brewing America that considered the entire global landscape of culinary ingredients to put into beer instead of just genuflecting to the traditional beer styles and beer ingredients, which are water, yeast, hops, and barley, that, you know, thousands of years ago, every region in the world made beers, you know, by what, and defined beer what was beautiful and grew under the ground they lived in and fermented in Africa, tree roots and honey in, in Turkey, uh, saffron and, and grapes. So it was only in the last 500 years that the Germans came up with this law called the Reinheitsgebot in the year 1516 that mandated beer could only be made with water, hops, and, and barley. Uh, and unfortunately, within a century, the rest of the world started bowing to this very narrow definition of beer. Uh, and so it was our goal to, to, to kind of go backwards in time to all these different cultures and consider all different ingredients for beer. Our earliest, our earliest beers include chicory stout uh, that's been made with chicory and coffee that's been roasted by our friend Amy at Lewis Bake Shop for every batch of that beer for, for 22 years. Uh, beers like our Immort Ale, uh, made with maple syrup from my family farm in western Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, beers like our Raison d'Etre, made with, with raisins and beet sugars, were among, among our first. And what's really rewarding for me is our company's been able to grow and be more innovative today than we were when we were the smallest brew in the country without wavering from that mission. Like, uh, you know, for about three or four years there, we frankly almost went out of business because we wouldn't dumb down or discount our beers at a very competitive moment in our industry, the late 90s supply for craft beer. Um, was over -clipsed, uh, or over demand for craft beer. And a lot of breweries went out of business in the late 90s, a lot of craft breweries. And while the Rehoboth pub is uh, a small fraction in terms of revenue of Dogfish Head's current uh, entire business, it is the soul of our company. Because we were strong in that local com community from the day we opened, thanks to the locals that supported us. And we had to take all the profits from our restaurant brewery in Rehoboth and bring them over to the production brewery that back then it was in Milton to keep from going bankrupt from about 1997 until 2000. But that, we never discounted our beer or dumbed down our beer. Uh, we were able to, to, to figure out innovative ways to stay in business uh, when the, the choice was shutting our doors. So for that reason, Rehoboth will always be a holy uh, part of our company uh, uh, to me. And like I said, we're more innovative today than we've ever been. Um, so looking at some, some, some newer innovations on the beer side of our company, this is a beer that comes out uh, um, uh, in about a month, you'll be able to get it here. Uh, it's a, basically a giant liquid birthday cake to ourselves. We turned 20 years old this year. And the first ever homebrew I made when I was living in New York, New York City was a cherry pale ale uh, I made with cherries I bought at a bodega. To make this more cake-like, we use uh, literally tons of cherries, uh, tart cherries, and then hundreds of pounds of cocoa nibs. Uh, as you can see, an innovation is the recipe, but also changing expectations. This beer 
will retail for about $216 a, a case, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, what, 10 times more than a normal uh, beer, but it's already pre-sold out to all our distributors before it came off our bottling line uh, because we could tie so much uh, story about the innovation around it. It is more like a port wine than a beer in that it's 17% alcohol. It ages as well as the finest Bordeaux, so we recommend people buy two bottles, drink one now, and drink one on our, our, our 40th anniversary uh, 20 years from now and put it in your cellar. Uh, we've done a series of events all around the country for the launch of this beer, birthday parties with beer-infused cupcakes. There's one I was at in uh, Denver, uh, Colorado. So the distributors know that we're out there not just expecting them to sell it, but we as coworkers are out there on the road talking about this beer and, and what differentiates it in terms of innovation to allow us to charge what we have to to make such an expensive uh, beer. And that spirit of innovation is alive in our breweries every, every day. And people say, well, Dogfish Head's relatively big now. They must have to turn like a giant you know, ocean liner at the scale that they are. But we've, at every step, woven opportunity for innovation into our company in the form of like skunk works within our buildings. So I don't know how to make beer on our biggest equipment in Milton. I'm very proud to say I'm the least uh, academically or technically uh, proficient brewer at our whole company. I love brewing at the little brewery at our pub in Rehoboth, a two barrel system, which is where I grew up uh, brewing the last uh, 20 years. And my favorite days of work are still when I go down there and brew a beer. When I come back into the country, nothing makes me more proud than to go to customs and, and write where it says occupation brewer on that line. Uh, and I think of myself as a brewer first and a business person second. Uh, and I think that uh, respect for our craft is uh, woven into every coworker, and to celebrate that, we have a program called Small Batch, which allows innovation to come from any of our 240 coworkers. You can go to a website, an internal website at our company, and sign up all, with four people from the company, and all you need is one coworker from our company that has some experience brewing homebrew, and we'll buy you all the ingredients, set up the day so that you can brew on one of our smaller systems. And it's uh, really, really cool because you get uh, a forklift driver from Milton on a team with a dishwasher from Rehoboth and the head of our IT uh, in Milton. And they come together, brew the wildest beer they can think of, get to know each other, get to know what their departments do throughout that six hour days. Uh, in departments that might not normally hang out with each other. And then three or four weeks later at Beer 30, which is our uh, weekly happy hour at 4.30, uh, that we shut down the company pretty much and we all get together and drink, drink beer together on, on 4.30. On you get yelled at at your cubicle if you're still standing there at 4.30. Yell, be in a browbeaten to go drink beer is a weird thing that happens at work, but uh, it's important to our culture. And at... at, at <laughs> at that event is the rest of the co-workers judge the homebrews from the small batch and the best of each quarter gets made and sold at our pubs. You can say, I made a beer that made it to market and got sold. Think how entrepreneurial that feels for a dishwasher or uh, somebody that works in our accounting department. And then the best of the year gets a trip up to New York City where we do the Beeria project with Mario Batali and they get treated like royalty at our brewing facility up there with an awesome meal and uh, catered dinner by the chefs of, of Mario and Joe Bastianich's uh, restaurants up there. So really important in internal form of uh, collaboration that is at the heart of our ability to stay really nimble and innovate uh, every, every day at our company. So when I think of innovations, I think of the, the ne next word out of my mouth is collaboration. And to me, regardless of the scale of your, your company, if you're, uh, y you know, unless you're the dominant market shareholder in your industry, you are a David in a world of Goliaths. Uh, which for me means that, that you know, we, we believe that there's, the, in the karma that comes with focusing on the positive energy of collaboration instead of focusing on the negative energy of competition. Because odds are, if you're a small company, competing uh, in, the, in the biggest sense in a marketplace usually means muscle to get through distribution and get to customers, and usually means efficiencies that allows you to charge the cheapest for whatever your service or, uh, or, or product is. And that's not a world where Davids can survive. So instead of hitting that brick wall of competition every day, to try and go over that wall by, by getting the hand of somebody that you can collaborate with, whether it's internal collaborations like the ones I mentioned in our small batch program or our own 
invent inventions of beers like the, uh, the higher math 20th anniversary beer that we conceived internally. We love those opportunities. We equally love the opportunities to look for great partners to collaborate outside um, of our brewery. Uh, or an example that's also coming to market in the next uh, two weeks, I'm wearing one of the shirts to, to, uh, to give them a shout out is our friends at uh, Woolrich. Um, that is much to me like DuPont, one of the most inspiring mid-Atlantic based companies uh, that also like DuPont goes back for so many generations. You know, Mariah and I are, uh, own our family uh, controlled company, Dogfish Head. Our son, Sammy, uh, was a food runner at our pub in Rehoboth uh, this past summer. I don't know if he and my daughter Greer want to carry this on as a family owned company, but we're hopeful that the opportunity will be there for them uh, to do that. Um, my son's now 16. You can imagine what a 16-year-old boy is like when you're trying to inspire him to think about, you know, doing what your mom and dad does. He told a story to his friend where he said, you know, Dogfish Head's the, one of the last places in the world I'll ever work. And, <laughs> and he said, I, I said, oh, yeah, really? He's like, yeah, the last place in the world I'll ever work is Urban Outfitters because they're stealing all the good vinyl from the independent record stores. <laughs> and he said, the second to last place I would ever work is Dogfish Head, and the third to last place I'd ever work is ISIS. He's like, I'm patriotic, but I'd rather go work for ISIS than work for you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so we're having him vetted through national security right, right now. And, uh, and then he came home and, and couldn't find a, a job, and then he went to our pub and got interviewed, and he's already... <laughs> so we saved another uh, confused kid from making the wrong evil decision uh, out in the world. Uh, so, uh, but at any rate, this collaboration, when I can tell my family, you know, my kids stories like this, where we're getting to work with the seventh generation family owners of this company, Josh Rich and his cousin Nick, and they tell stories about making blankets and, and uniforms uh, during the Civil War, that they've been around as a family owned company from before the Civil War, just four and a half, five hours up the road from where we're uh, sitting right now. It's tremendously inspiring. And when your innovation is also about learning, and I have way more to learn than I have to teach. And doing these collaborative projects lets us understand how a company can, ex can, can move forward in an extremely competitive textile and fashion industry for literally over a century and stay family controlled. Tremendously uh, rewarding collaboration where I, I drove up to the woods of Woolrich, Pennsylvania, had to time my trip based on when the, the shoots come off of the spruce tips, the spruce trees up in the forest of Woolrich, and then they shut down their textile mills for two full days and all of the coworkers of Woolrich came out in the woods with me and we got, I think, 40 glad trash bags full of fresh spruce tips put them in my uh, car, packed in. I was the only thing that had room for me in the car. It smelled like I had 7,000 of those little trees that you hang up in your car. <laughs> Cars never smelled better. Uh, and, and got them back down. We freeze and thaw the spruce. Uh, and then uh, we brew this beer called Pennsylvania Tuxedo. That's what it's called when hunters wear both the red and black check pants and the red and black check shirt. That's a, a Pennsylvania tuxedo. This spruce tip infused beer uh, hits the market uh, in, in a couple of weeks. But external collaborations are just a, a big part of what we're, we're all about. Um, here's a quote from, uh, from uh, the Dalai Lama that was uh, also an early inspiration. Uh, uh, you, you guys can, can read it. I won't keep reading the quotes. But uh, for me, oh wait, that's not him. That's our buddy Andy Warhol. I got them all screwed up here. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but that's, uh, I think they're back to back, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so here's the, the Dalai Lama quote. And, and you know, that one, uh, again, is about concern for others than ourselves. And in the business ways that we do that, in terms of ways that do have a revenue uh, or potentially a profit component to them, an example would be like Pennsylvania tuxedo. But there's also just so many ways that we uh, can, can work on this collaborative compassion within our community that are not about profits and are more about uh, giving back. Mark mentioned it to me earlier that he got to run in our dogfish dash. And you know, we, our company has a formal policy where we, we go by units of beer. A barrel of beer is uh, 31 gallons. That's how brewers calibrate our world because that's what we pay taxes on. And so Dogfish Head gives X dollars per barrel that we make back to local causes in our community. And we choose the causes that really resonate with our brand. So it's not 
pure altruism where we get nothing back from it because we make all natural beers and food that people consume. It makes sense that our biggest uh, nonprofit that we work with is the Nature Conservancy because their whole mission is about protecting the natural lands on which some of our ingredients uh, grow. So for us, every year we do our Dogfish Dash. It's our biggest uh, single uh, nonprofit event. Uh, this year, I think we raised about $123,000 for the Delaware chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and we're very, very proud of that opportunity. Um, we work with Habitat for Humanity. We've built houses within miles of here where we shut down our whole company. And we have awesome sets of tools because we've got engineers and, and chefs and people that are really good with instruments. And then we've got people like me that aren't. Uh, so they team idiots like me up with really smart people with tools and we go and build houses uh, and again sort of get to know each other. We team ourselves up with people that aren't in our departments uh, and give back to the community uh, that way as well. As local as right outside my front door, I live in beautiful downtown uh, Lewis. We recently sponsored a couple teams uh, for the Dragon Boat uh, races uh, and uh, you know a another wonderful nautical uh, moment for us to give back to a, a local school that we uh, believe uh, strongly uh, in. So those moments to give back are so critical. And like I said, they're not altruistic. It feels good, but it comes back. There is an ROI on those opportunities. And the innovation there comes with picking the partners that actually make sense for your heart and for your brand when you uh, own a company or, or do something in the community. One way that that came back to us recently is we were stunned uh, when we went to do a, a renovation of our Rehoboth property and to put in a brand new uh, state-of-the-art uh, restaurant, R&D brewery and distillery, working with the award-winning architects that designed our, our Milton uh, facility. And upon first vetting that with uh, a, a, a group of regulators in Rehoboth, we were told, ah, we don't want to see you do something in Rehoboth. In fact, we, we'd like to see you move out of the town after being there for 20 years and creating X amount of jobs. And we were a little bit stunned. Uh, but it was amazing. Before Mariah or I could you know, kind of get out of our, our awestruck moment, social media uh, kind of buzz started happening when that became public. And it was so heartwarming to see all these different groups of dogfish supporters rally to our cause, whether it was other retail rest restaurant and retail owners saying, hey, you know, their business helps our business, especially in the off season, um, or folks in other towns saying, hey, let's start a petition to ask if they'll move here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we, we, as I said, Rehoboth is the soul of our company. There was no way we were going to give up that, that, that thing. We were ready to fight for it. And we didn't have to, and calmer minds prevailed. But the coolest message that came out of that was as Mariah flicked through, and she's the queen of our social media, she flicked through the comments that came through that moment. The minority of them talked about, yeah, I want them to stay there because I love their beer, or I love uh, their wood-grilled pizza. The majority of the comments were things like, you know, I'm on the board of the Rehoboth Film Festival and Dogfish Head's given money to that every year. Or, you know, I help to plant flowers in Lewis and keep that beautiful and Dogfish Head does the donations and they have it outside their place. So the majority of the comments had nothing to do with the products they make, that we make. They had to do with the ways that we give back uh, to the community. So it was a really challenging and, 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 and um, you know, could, could have been a negative moment. Couldn't have ended more positively uh, for us with that feedback we got. Um, and so then I will go to that, that, uh, that Warhol quote, uh, just because it kind of goes with what I'm saying is, you know, oftentimes businesses are kind of reflexively vilified and, and people are like, oh, businesses, all they are is about is, is making money. And we really don't approach it that way at all. For us, that, 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 that center of innovation is about approaching what we do as community building and art more than we approach it as a, our, a, a way to make uh, profits. And if the, the, the love for the beer precedes the love for the business and we make amazing products with unique stories around them, then the business will take care of itself. But they're both intertwined and we should not feel bad to be business people, especially if we're taking the time to find those entities and groups that we can give our help to that also help our company uh, as well. Um, so then moving forward, a little less time on these, and I'm sure Leanne will tell me when I'm getting a little tight on, on time. Um, you know, the, this is again sort of a, a moment of talking about how do you weave your local geography um, 
into the creativity of your, your services and products. Uh, that one on the right was, uh, the date's wrong, it was actually from about three weeks ago. The cover of the Wall Street Journal did a, a story on uh, brewing with exotic ingredients. And I thought it was really telling, like the karma of focusing on Tawar, your, your local grounds, that of all the beers, the 30 or 40 beers that Dogfish Head makes, they focused on two of them, one of which we make with lobster, if you can believe it or not, uh, from where I grew up in the summers, Dogfish Head, Maine. And the reason our company has this goofy name is like Hilton Head, Dogfish Head's actually a place off of Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. And my best friend growing up is a lobsterman up there. And I have him send me hundreds of pounds of lobster once a year. And we boil this lobster in the boil kettle with the beer. Uh, and we make a beer with cocoa nibs and tons of lobsters called Chalk Lobster. Uh, so that's one of the two beers that they, they wrote about. And the other was a beer we do called Beer for Breakfast. So our brewery, there's now hundreds of breakfast themed stouts in America. We brewed the first one with the local coffee roasted in Lewis. Uh, but we wanted to celebrate the anniversary, 20th anniversary of that, epi that, that and we wanted to have another um, local component to that beer in addition to the locally roasted coffee. So we reached out to our friends at Rapa Scrapple, uh, employ many, many people uh, in this area, and we had we worked with them to design an especially lean version of their Scrapple uh, uh, so that there would be no weird stuff floating on top of our beer. And they were awesome at helping us design something that, that tasted and smelled like we wanted it to, but worked in the context of, of the brewing uh, te technique. Uh, and we did this beer called Beer for Breakfast, made with maple syrup, coffee, uh, and uh, Scrapple. And it was the most important, I was just at the Great American Beer Fest, the country's biggest festival. The number one uh, beer at our booth, and we had the longest line at the festival, was a black and tan, a mix of the lobster beer with the Scrapple beer, and we were selling it as a surf and turf black and tan. <laughs> and we were just laughing to ourselves, saying, I can't believe we have a line for this, but it, it actually tastes really good. Uh, and we had the logos of Rapa Scrapple on, on that booth, and, we, and we, we're talking about how it was made with lobsters from Dogfish Head, Maine, and again, the karma of giving back to those other entities uh, in innovative ways is, uh, was key for us. Um, Moving forward a bit, uh, just on, on the left, I won't spend a ton of time on the, the Daily Meal, named us the number one brewery in the country recently, and uh, what the beer they focus on was Namaste. So innovations don't have to always be wholesale uh, inventions. Just slightly tweaking what's already out there and putting your own thumbprint on it can sometimes be enough. Uh, if you look at, you know, the, the, the Wright brothers weren't the first folks to, to build a, 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 a glider that, that stayed in the air for some amount of time, but the innovations that they did around an invention that they didn't make is what we remember in, in the history of civilization. Uh, so a beer, this is a beer we do called Namaste. Uh, Mariah had done yoga one morning. I asked everyone at our family table, hey, give me a name for a beer. I'm brewing today and one ingredient. And she said, uh, how about calling it Namaste and how about putting lemongrass in it? So on the way in, I was thinking, well, what could I do with lemongrass? It would work well with citrus fruit. There's this, you know, centuries old Belgian beer called a white beer made with orange peel and lemongrass. So we added, it was our idea to just add orange flesh in addition to the orange peel that's traditional, and lemongrass, and call the beer uh, Namaste. Um, and it's now our fastest growing beer, faster growing than our 60 minute or 90, because it's not as bitter and it's more approachable. So um, a tiny tweak of a style that existed for over 100 years was the innovation in that case. Um, and then, you know, the, the, another way to consider innovation is you know, how you present your brand and your communication can be innovation as well. It doesn't have to be the product or the service itself. It can also be the way and the, and the mediums in which you attract customers to your brand. And again, this is where Mariah is so strong. I'm sort of the analog face of our company. I do a lot of events. I'm here talking with you guys today. I'm doing a, a, an event in New York City uh, tonight. Um, but Mariah is somewhere on a plane doing a, a post for social media for him, I'm sure. And we have the largest uh, online uh, um, community of any craft brewery in the country. And I think a part of that is because we're not always trying to sell something. You know, we're often celebrating something another brewery is doing or taking an article from some other you know, art forum and saying, hey, we think beer lovers might like this. So over 20 years of this honest human scale dialogue, instead of the traditional marketing monologue where giant companies scream at you from TV screens and billboards, 20 years of us honing this honest 
you know, human scale dialogue has paid off greatly because our voice, our brand voice is very trusted because they know that we're not always trying to sell them on something. We're trying to communicate with them, learn from them, and respectfully, you know, admire it that if and when they like the beers, they'll tell people that we're, we're great. We're not going to tell people we're great. We just want to make sure they know what we're making and know what excites us uh, as, as a brand. A um, few other things, and I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I'll move quickly. Uh, today I am, I'm going up to New York. We have a new show launching today to talk about innovation. It's called That's Odd, Let's Drink It. <laughs> uh, and the first episode I shot uh, with my good friend Mario Batali. He's co-hosting this event with me at Beeria tonight. Uh, he's part of this great uh, nonprofit thing called Waste Ed, education for chefs about how much food is wasted, where they go around all their affiliated restaurants and find food that's a little past its prime to sell, but then they repurpose it into stocks and sauces so it doesn't go bad. And when I read about that, I'm like, hmm, brewers should get into the act as well. I mean, we feed thousands of head of cattle on the Delmarva uh, Peninsula uh, through the hundreds of tons of spent grain that leave our brewery every day as cow feed. So we're really sensitive. Uh, to, uh, to that recycling uh, process. Um, so with that show, he found some old uh, tomatoes that were overly ripe and some old citrus fruit. I'm like, what are we going to make with tomatoes and citrus fruit? And then I remembered, not because I spent time in prison, but I read a lot about prison, <laughs> that the universal prison wine called Pruno is usually made with sugar-rich ketchup from tomatoes, and brown sugars and citrus fruit. It's usually made in the back of the toilet, but I skipped that part. Uh, and we brewed a batch of pruno from these ingredients that were about to go bad through Mario's restaurants using wheat, uh, tomatoes, uh, and citrus uh, fruit, bread, and some sugars uh, as well. So it's a show that begins airing today and will air every week. And it's a way for us to innovate in beer, but learn from different collaborators in every show. So next week, I'm, I'm, uh, there's an episode with me and Chris Bosch from the Miami Heat, uh, who's a huge home brewer. Uh, and he, he's from Texas, loves mesquite barbecue. We brewed a, a beer with smoky barbecue uh, uh, barley that was smoked over bar, uh, mesquite wood uh, for that one. Um, you know, and, and every week's a little different one. I'll let you uh, check it out if you want to. But the other, the, there's the innovation of learning from the collaborators, but also there's an opportunity for Dogfish Head to interact with these communities that other breweries don't or can't touch. So suddenly, you know, Chris Bosch is, is talking to Sports Illustrated about our, our brewery or this show. We're reaching an, a, an audience that the other 4,000 breweries in America are not, or the rapper Mac Miller we did an episode with. Not a lot of breweries reaching out to the hip hop world to have those conversations, but we're gonna be, you know, in, through that episode doing it. So it's a way of innovative to find new audiences, not just to innovate to make the beers uh, that are on the shows. Um, just moving quickly, just showing off some of the uh, neat packaging that we are designing internally so that even the point of purchase for our beer isn't just a generic sign that says here's the aisle that has dogfish beer but you know analog beers for the digital age is one of our longtime rallying cries so we're the official sponsor of record store day which promotes all the independent uh, record stores around the country um, we ha give out these analog uh, record players that we've branded as part of that our pumpkin ale born right down the road at, at uh, Pumpkin Chunkin 21 years ago as a homebrew is a big uh, fall promotion for us. We do a lot of IPAs, so IPAs for the holidays is a big uh, promotion for us as well. Um, so uh, moving more, more quickly, I don't know, what do I have left? How many minutes? Yeah, I'm okay? All right, I'll go a little more quickly. I'll go a little more quickly. Um, uh, so this one, you know, is a, is a rallying cry from, from Moby Dick, and it just shows a part of being innovative is being curious and looking outside of your industry for inspiration. You know, I get all the beer, you know, we advertise in some beer publications. We never bring them into our house. I, I advertise them because they're friends of mine that publish them, but I don't really want beer publications in my house because I don't want to read what my friends are, are doing. I'm psyched for them if they're successful and found something, but I don't want to be influenced by what's already out there in my industry. So in our house, we get lots of arts, culinary, wine publications and, and books that we buy and music publications, which is another big passion of mine. And I try to find ways uh, to look at other industries that I admire and maybe relate to our industry to get creative inspiration instead of looking what's already uh, happening uh, in my own uh, industry. And that's led us to do a lot of focus outside of beer. And it might seem uh, counterintuitive 
that you know beer is the lifeblood of our company, but we've purposely started all these complementary companies. We started 20 years ago as food and beer. Um, you know, uh, another part of successful innovation is simple messages and uh, you know doing something really unique and exciting, but distilling it down to something simple and digestible. So that as, as innovative as it is, the, the person that you want to convince to try it needs to be able to translate it. Uh, and sometimes when you innovate, that's a challenge that we've had is we've gotten too clunky and wordy and technical, and we really have to keep the messages on why we're innovative, simple and digestible uh, to people. And you know, the, I've had the same neon signs in the front of our pub for 20 years. Uh, you know, wood grilled food and homemade beer. That's been the basis of our company. Uh, a lot of innovation within those two simple signs, but they've been, uh, they, they've been the, you know, the same thing for that long. 13 years ago, we opened the second craft distillery uh, in the country. We've now expanded that, uh, which we start launching around the state uh, in a few weeks uh, with very innovative gins and vodkas distilled and brewed from scratch in our own facility. A lot of spirits that you hear about, uh, you know, Tito's vodka or whatever it is, they talk about the taste and the flavor and it's handcrafted, but they actually buy uh, GNS, grain neutral spirits and drums, and don't actually make the stuff from scratch themselves. Through our tours at our Milton facility, we're going to show that we're innovating from the raw products out of the, grain, out of the ground and making our spirits 100% from scratch. Um, here's the facades of the new facilities that we'll have uh, in downtown Rehoboth and sort of our general schedule. Uh, media in the room, please don't hold me to the, these schedules. They are a restaurant project, and uh, after all, they, uh, they, they never happen on time. Uh, but uh, you can see, you know, the, the, the beautiful entrance to Chesapeake and Maine, uh, which is the, the location that will open next to our existing pub first sometime around uh, January or February uh, of, of the, in the coming months, and then the completely rebuilt, brand new Brewings and Eats uh, to the right of Dogfish, Chesapeake, uh, and Maine. Um, you uh, are in, it probably seemed counterintuitive that we have an in in uh, a, a place, but again, thinking of ways, innovative ways that your, your customers or potential customers can spend time with your brand. That was the sentence that led us to, to move forward on this hotel pro project, which was, you know, if someone loves our beer in Chicago or Florida, they're pretty much hanging out with our brand for 20 minutes or half an hour on a bar stool somewhere in America. If someone loves us enough to come visit our brewery, then they get to hang out with our brand and meet how awesome our coworkers are and see how great our facility is for an hour while they take a tour of Milton. If they really, really like our brand, then they maybe go to our pub and spend two hours over the course of an evening having a meal, getting to try different things from Dogfish. We said, what if we could create a space where uh, we can hang out with people who love our beer for 24 hours at least? And then really in a, in a non-pushy way, just let them see what we're all about, meet our coworkers, see how beautiful coastal Delaware is, um, and then uh, leave with their own impressions and hopefully they'll be evangelists for our brands if they went that, that deep with us. So that ends only 17-ish rooms, but it's really critical to us as sort of a, 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 a deep immersion, like all senses immersion to our brand. You know, strategically located about eight miles from our Milton Brewery in one direction and eight miles from our pub in Rehoboth uh, in, the, in the other direction. And you know, we, we, we probably could have addressed legislation that would have allowed us to have beer uh, for sale there, but I live three blocks from there, and my friends own the, the restaurants and, and other hotels in town. I see our mayor, Ted, uh, here, and there's a motto in front of our, you can barely see it there, but it says, welcome to Lewis, Mother Nature, let's do this. Uh, and I wrote that motto because I want to remind people how to pronounce Lewis, uh, number one. But we also wanted people to get out of our hotel and go out and explore the beauty of coastal Delaware on the bikes we provide or paddle boards, but also to go to r &L Liquors or uh, Touch of Italy and try our beer at other places, maybe bring it back to the room, but to go out and explore is what that hotel is all about, exploring our brand. Uh, and uh, this is almost lastly, but you see some of our external sort of innovative relationships. So we don't own the Dogfish Head uh, ale houses that are in the DC market, but it gives us a local bricks and mortar presence in our one of our key metro areas. We work with a great 
reputable group of restaurateurs and we license them our brand. It's a leap of faith. We can't mandate that they have to serve our, you know, only our beers. They could be serving Miller and Coors and whatever in there. We can't force that, but there's a, a great trust uh, in this collaboration that they'll do well by our, our brand and every quarter they bring buses of their coworkers to our brewery for deep uh, beer education classes. So they're out there every day you know, selling what's unique about our brand in a critical uh, local metro market. Same for the Italy Birria projects. We do them with Mario Batali and Joe Bastianich uh, and the Italy empire of retailers based in Italy. So we have breweries with our logo over them in Chicago, New York City, uh, and Rome, Italy, where we program, design the recipes, train the brewers, design the equipment, and we're getting ready to announce another U.S. city that we're having another brewery Italy opening. And again, it, get, it makes us a local brewery in these far-flung metro markets and gives our brand a local presence uh, when local is becoming more of a buzzword, whether it's in farmers markets or the, the brewing world. So, you know, in closing, you know, that when I first drew that, uh, that logo on my business plan when Mariah was still finishing up at Brown and I was moonlighting at, a, at an ad agency in Providence. When I first drew it, I wanted it to have those little holes in it and be really, uh, you know, raw and rough. And that broken outer edge to me back then meant, you know, raw, unfiltered, all natural beers, rustic, wood grilled food. Uh, but in time, you know, what it's come to mean to me as I think about our company and our history of innovation is the two solids in our logo, the big fish and the solid. Uh, in inner line, to me the fish represents the beer of our business. It is the biggest part of our logo, it is the biggest part of our company. The unbroken inner line represents food, which again, since, since, since the day we opened, we had two signs, wood grilled food and homemade beer. Those have been the constants for 20 years. All those other broken lines around to me now really represent these complementary industries that we've innovated in. Our distillery, our, our merchandise collaborations with Woolrich, uh, you know, our hotel. And what they do is it's kind of, they act as portals for people that might not normally come towards a brewery to get to know our brand and come towards our core business of beer, maybe through uh, the nature world because they went birding and used our hotel or they were spirits drinkers and found our vodka. But it also protects us, it acts as a halo around that fish as that logo navigates a world that now has 4,000 other beer logos out in the world of, of beer in America. All that complementary stuff around that fish helps to protect the integrity and distinction of our core business of, of beer. Um, so, you know, in, in closing, uh, uh, my hat's off to what each of, of you guys do, and I, I wish you great fun and success. Oh, I'm the last, the fun part, uh, uh, there's a... Um, great uh, musician Warren Zevon, most people know his uh, uh, song Werewolves of London and uh, David uh, Letterman was a huge uh, Warren Zevon fan and Warren got uh, cancer very late and couldn't be, uh, it was inoperable and you know David is a huge fan, I had him on, on the show a couple weeks before uh, he passed and he played and David got teary and said well if there's one thing you want to tell the crowd out there uh, Warren and all your, uh, you know, as, a, as a poet, what would it be? And he said, enjoy every sandwich, which was a way of saying, you know, carpe diem, enjoy the moment. And I always love thinking about innovative projects that we haven't started yet at Dogfish in the future when I'm on a paddleboard or a bike in the morning. Those are my favorite moments of the day. But then when I get to work, I think of all those opportunities about the innovative things that we already have going on at our company, the small batch program, uh, the hotel, our tasting, and that opportunity to go deeper and make the innovative things that your company have already embarked on richer with your creative energies instead of always just trying to think of the next new thing that's going to take up even more new resources. That opportunity to go deeper on what's already innovative in your world today is a, a, an awesome opportunity. So I, I wish you luck on your own journeys uh, and thank you guys uh, for, 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 for listening. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.